Hello and good evening and welcome to today's webinar on Allium. My name is Deborah and I'm a volunteer at the Minnesota Hortic State Horticultural Society. If you're not a member of MSHS, now is a good time to join. Members receive not only our award-winning magazine, but also discounts at nurseries and greenhouses, free tickets to our local home show, free webinars, and more. Your membership dollars also allow us to bring great programming like this to all of you. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. You are attending the webinar in listen-only mode, so you will be able to hear our presenter, but we cannot hear you. That way, there won't be any background noise. You will receive an email with a link to a copy of the recording of this webinar within 24 to 48 hours of us finishing here tonight. If you have questions for our presenter, you can type those in on the panel on the right side of your screen. We will be covering questions as we go, so send them in as you think of them. If you don't see the panel, look for an orange arrow in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Click on that arrow and it'll pop out the panel. And now, please welcome today's speaker, Mary Frances McGuire Lerman. Mary learned how to garden from her grandmothers, Frances Ann Morgan Reagan and Teresa Lillian von Kinder McGuire. Her mother was too busy raising eight children. She was the young, she was, excuse me, was the oldest daughter and the gardener and lawnmower at her family home. When she entered college, she discovered horticulture science at the University of Minnesota. Mary graduated in 1974 with a degree in horticultural science and immediately began working at the Como Conservatory. In fact, she was the one who suggested the installation of a bromeliad display in a dome garden, which was first planted in 1975. In 1976, she was hired away by the Minneapolis Board, Park and Recreation Board, where she worked for 32 years as the horticulturalist, designing, directing, and expanding garden operations creating the naturalist program at the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden, initiating the invasive species removal programs, and working for five years with state agencies to get buckthorn declared a restricted noxious weed in Minnesota to prevent any further propagation or sale. During our stay at home time, she has been preparing and presenting numerous webinars for MSHS on a variety of genera of flowering plants. Take it away, Mary. Okay, Deb. Tonight we're going to talk about the wonderful genera called of alliums. Um, alliums um, are are centered, shall we say, focused around the Mediterranean region, going up into the mountains. This is where many of them have originated from. But then there's also been a tremendous amount of breeding work done with alliums, particularly by the Dutch. Um, over the last probably half century. And so there's been some newer varieties brought into the market. Um, I know a little later, um, Laura from the Hort Society is gonna talk to you about the bulb program they have tied in with Brent and Becky's bulbs where you can purchase a lot of different bulbs, not just your traditional tulips and daffodils, but some of the other bulb groups, including alliums. So if you're wanting to get some of these for your garden, Laura is going to tell you about that in a, in a short while as far as how you can order so that it actually provides a great benefit to the Minnesota State Hort Society. And also you will then have an opportunity to listen to um, another presentation by Brent um, on a number of different bulb topics. I believe you have a choice there. So to start with, most of the alliums that are sold out there are thrive in zones three to 10. Some are listed as zone five and higher. I have grown a number of them that would say zone five or six. And I think with our climate change that we've been seeing over the last 30 years here in Minnesota, if it says zone five, I would recommend here for Southern Minnesota, you can easily give it a chance. And I would even go up to zone six. Um, when you get near zone six, selecting the planting location for your bulbs is important. You wanna have a very good snow cover all winter. 
and ideally also if they can be located closer to the foundation of your home or building that has a heat source, that soil will stay considerably warmer during the winter than much further out from the house. It's um, a member of the amaryllis family and all the um, allium foliage when you crush it has that really strong garlic onion smell to it and it's pronounced allium and its seed heads provide texture in the garden. Now you need to know there's two different groups of alliums out there. There are the bulbous alliums that must be planted in the fall and there are the fibrous rooted alliums. In other words, they have a, a finely divided root system like most of your perennials. And those are generally sold through garden centers in the spring. And if they have them throughout the summer, you can plant them then. Um, if they're on clearance at the garden centers now, you can certainly plant them also. Um, what's important is any fibrous rooted perennial, you wanna make sure if you're dividing it or planting it new that you wanna do this by the end of September. So it has plenty of time to get its roots further down uh, before the extreme cold comes. So it's um, allium is Latin for garlic and flowering onions are around there in many heights and sizes. And they're generally considered rabbit, rodent and deer resistant and seldom affected by disease. However, one thing I wanna point out about the bulbous iris that would be planted in the fall is that they often come up very early in the spring. And so if we have frosts that come in, um, you'll often have the foliage damaged quite severely so that you'll have brown um, sections on the leaves. And what I started doing, because so many of these um, tend to have fairly good sized foliage in the plants as they're coming up is to save some three to five gallon pots, you know, from garden centers. Um, and many times if you go to a garden center and say, I'm, I'm looking for some empty pots in this size, everybody's having trouble getting these recycled. So it's kind of easy to track them down. Or if you go to a um, landscape contractor would be another spot to check for those. And what I do is I put them over, I turn them upside down over the alliums when we're gonna have a frost. Um, and then I put, um, and because there's holes in the pots, you don't want those open. Then I put a small cloth over that and hold it down with a rock. Um, and then the following day, if we're, if we're out of the freeze weather, I take it off. If we're gonna have a couple days in a row, um, you need to save your pots nearby. You should take the cover off each day so they can get sunlight and adjust to the temperature. So generally, when do you plant the allium bulbs in the fall? If you look in the second paragraph, they should be planted outdoors in the fall after the soil has cooled down to around 55 degrees. And this is normal, normally after two weeks that you've had night temperatures around 40 degrees. And most allium are not recommended for forcing over the winter. There are some that will force. Um, and this is a real tricky operation. You're gonna see a few photos of some that were forced for the Tatton Park Flower Show in England. Um, this was done by a allium specialist grower and nursery, and they probably know all the tricks to that. I don't know that we have all the detail available um, otherwise in order to figure out the exact timing. So these photos I'm gonna show you are showing a wide range of alliums that would bloom from spring until fall, and they were all blooming in mid-July in England for this show. Um, when, when we go through these, we're gonna go through a lot of the images quickly because I have about 50 slides for you to see. Um, the flower sites that's mentioned is presented as the width or diameter of the flower. And most alliums are sphere-like flowers, but there are some that have a flattened base to them. Um, and as far as planting allium bulbs, um, based on the size, they'll tell you anywhere from three to four inches deep to six to eight inches deep. 
Um, the bloom is generally for the bulbous ones from May up until August. Um, for the fibrous ones, they normally start blooming in later June and in, into July. So thinking about alliums, often we think of just big clusters of them to put together, but we should think about combining them with perennials and annuals. So I have a couple images here from some different catalogs to give you an idea. So on the left, you're seeing lupins uh, mixed in with some of the early mauve um, alliums. And on the right, you're seeing the drumstick um, allium with a gyro called paprika. Um, and I never had thought about this combination. This is a combination of plants that uh, White Flower Farm sells out of their catalog in the fall because they found it's such a nice contrast. You have different textures and then the deeper color of the drumstick allium really pops um, the color of the paprika. So let's look at some of the species and varieties that are out there. Um, amethystinum, uh, red mohican, a relatively new one out there. This is what some of the breeding has been doing where you have individual smaller flowers on the lower part of the so-called globe. And then you have a longer um, or elongated flowers up at the very top. This is a tall one over four feet in height. Here's some shorter ones. And this is what you're going to see with alliums. They're going to be from uh, some six to eight inches tall, some up to five to six feet in height. Um, and many of these have been in the, in the horticulture trade for a long time period. This one's noting 1857. Um, again, a shorter one that's best planted in clusters. So for a May, June blooming, this is great with its height for a rock garden or the front edge of a border. Allium atropurpureum, which we saw on the cover slide of this um, webinar. This goes back even further to 1800. And notice on each of these, these are texts coming from the different catalogs, is they're all listed as rabbit, rodent, and deer resistant. But Deb was telling me she's been having problems so Deb, which well, varieties of alliums were you seeing deer damage on? I was actually, it, it only happened the once, um, but I was given a very good piece of advice years ago um, by someone who was working the MSHS booth uh, at one of the shows, which was never put anything on a rabbit's will not eat list. And what I found was that my, um, from my herbs, my chives were very carefully nibbled all to a specific length. Um, however, as alliums are poisonous to rabbits, rodents, deer, cats, and dogs, I'm assuming that that rabbit only tried it once. Um, that's that's probably probably true. Yeah, and that, that is something that people should keep in mind is that if you have animals that go out of doors, you're going to want to keep an eye on them around the alliums. Hopefully they will all be smarter than that particular rabbit. Right. And and this one, the atropurpureum, um, they're showing it combined here with another white flowering allium. Um, these tend to not have the globe shape. If you look at it compared to the white one, which is more of a globe shape, you'll see how it tapers down to the stem. So it's more of like a, a person's face that you're looking at that has a very large face you know, to spread out rather than that globe form to it. And I didn't mention that all the alliums are very attracted um, they attract the bees and the butterflies together. Then you have, um, you'll, you'll typically see a lot of mauve and purple and lavender blooms in alliums, but there are also some blues. This one goes back to 1830. They called it the blue of the heavens, and it is a cornflower blue color. The stems are very thin. This is one that you really want to plant into large groupings to get to the effect. 
And you also want to put a stake in each fall to remember where they are. Because frequently when they come up, their leaves are so thin that I've seen people mistake them, including myself, as a grassy weed coming in. And then I start to dig them out and then I find the bulb. So just a warning there. This one I have never grown, but I found it online and I wanted to suggest it for view. It's zone five, but again, we're pretty much here in the cities changing into zone five with all the climate change. This is one that I would probably only be available from these two companies. They're specialty alpine plant growers. Um, but look at this for a trough or a rock garden. Um, and it blooms later in the summer coming in around August and September. So maybe somebody can give that a, ch a chance and uh, report back. Then we have another um, blue, bluish species, although there's a selection out there which has almost a turquoise look um, where it's, the coloration is just on the edge of the petals and the inside is white. Um, these were native to Central Asia. So in addition to the Mediterranean area, you go a little bit east of there um, and into the mountains, you will find them. Um, Alliums can be um, shipped by mail order to most states in the union. However, if you look at these catalogs, almost all of them have indicated that Idaho and Utah do not allow their importation. So it's become very obvious to me that even though it's a drier climate, that some of these have become invasive in those areas. I have not seen that issue here in Minnesota except maybe when you're talking about the abundance of seeding that happens uh, with the garlic, um, garlic chives. Then we have um, Rosy Beauty. If you're looking more for a real pink, um, but there's a little hint of lavender into it, this is one native to the Himalayans. Um, give it a try. Christophii is a favorite of a lot of people. It's called the Star of Persia. Notice here when you're looking at it, again, it doesn't form a complete globe. It kind of has its lower base close to level. Um, the flower sizes are amazing. Um, and they have metallic shiny green ovaries. If you look in the photo on the right, you'll see them. And 18 to 24 inches in height. Again, this is late May and into June, so an earlier flowering allium. Here's another early flowering one for May, um, Allium kawanii, which is related to Allium neapolitanum from 1823. The um, bloom sizes, two inches in diameter. Notice that they look great when they're planted in clusters. When you talk about growing large alliums, you typically talk about planting, you know, three of them and plant them nine to 12 inches apart um, because their foliage gets so large. This you're wanting to go with at least six or more together planted in a very close area. This says six to nine. It's related to Neapolitanum. I would say if you're if you want to spend a little money to try it. I think you might still be successful with this. Then we have the gigantic ones that they always have photos of kids standing next to them admiring these truly large plants. This is one of the largest, probably the largest pink flowering one called Twinkling Stars. Uh, four to, four to um, five feet tall, four and a half feet tall. And Notice that the diameter of the bloom is five and a half inches. It's just an amazing one. Um, and so these are things that you often put into the back of your garden. And notice it's zone three to eight. So you can grow it up into northern Minnesota. Here is another May bloomer, um, frequently used in rock gardens because of its height. Um, and again, it's bulbous, so it's planted in the fall, Caratibians, um, Ivory Queen. It has these large um, 
diameter leaves that reflex down um, when you see them. It's not because people have over or have underwatered. It's just the way the plant grows. And there's a little fine red edge to the leaf, which really doesn't appear in the photos here. Allium molly has been around for a long, long time. Um, but Janine was introduced in 1978, and it's a bit more vigorous. And you can see whether it's in bud on the left or in bloom on the right, it's quite amazing. This is one where you want to plant a large quantity of them um, together for a mass effect. Uh, Neapolitanum from the Naples area in, in Italy um, and also Northern Africa. This was, this was called the Bride's Onion in the 19th century um, and it was used in wedding bouquets so add a little spicy fragrance to your wedding bouquets and again it's saying zone six i have been able to grow these without an issue here in the twin cities um, here's another low growing allium it kind of looks like ivory queen or caritiviance because it has the reflex leaves to it but you have this pink purple flowers to them and notice how if you look closely at each flower it's like it's striped and the stamens that are coming out are an intense um, greenish yellow allium nigrum uh, formerly known as allium multibulbosum giving you an idea of what you're going to find underground when you go to dig them and divide them um, this goes back to the 18th century three to four diameter three to four inch diameter blooms um, there's some recent introductions called pink jewel and silver spring typically the one that's been out for years is the white flowering one that you see on the right which is the species and notice that there's no leaves there this is from the tatton park flower show it was an allium grower that had a display and he had forced these um, so that all of his alliums that he wanted to show um, came into bloom around mid-July for that show. Uh, zone four, this is something blooming in June, July, and um, you don't want to remove the foliage except for an exhibit like this where they added the moss around um, because that foliage is constantly producing food to store down to make your bulb bloomer or larger the next year with better blooms. Here's Nevskianum, um, again, another low growing one. It also has the big reflex leaves like Kerativiance. Um, and so it's frequently used in rock gardens or front of the border. They'd probably be nice if you have hostas in a, um, a semi sunny area, not your blue foliage hostas, but some of the others. Um, these could be planted in and around hostas so that the hosta foliage does not overtake them. Then we have nigrum. Uh, no, wait a minute. I went the wrong way. <laughs> wait a minute. No, I didn't. Let's see. Here's nigrum. So nigrum has the white flowers. No, wait a minute. We looked at no, this, No, we did we? do nigrum. We okay, nigrum. all right. There but we go. Maybe, here we go. New tans. Here we go. So new tans is another beautiful pink. And this is a late bloomer in midsummer. Um, this is a shorter 12 to 24 inch high plant. And you can see the thickness of the stems is not huge. So again, this is one I would do um, some mass plantings with um, in clusters. Then we have Oreophyllum, which has much larger blooms. Notice this is zone three to seven. So another one we could, could plant up in Northern Minnesota. Um, two inch diameter um, blooms as far as the entire cluster, but each individual flower is quite amazing. Um, and again, a rock garden plant, six to eight inches. Then we have garlic. And if you want to grow garlic this year, the time to plant it is usually in early to mid-October because the soils have to cool down. So what you see on the right in the lower photo, someone is preparing garlic for consumption. When you go to plant garlic, you want to 
take the cloves but not remove um, the outer scales as has been done here for food preparation. And each individual scale is then planted in the ground um, about six to eight inches apart in a row. Uh, get your soil back in. You want this to be good soil, nutrient rich because the, the garlic uses up a lot of food in, to produce the bulbs. And then after you've planted them, then you want to put a light mulch over them. So you could do straw or hay, or sometimes if you ha grow cannas, you know, in the fall, you have to wait till they turn black. You can just cut them off at the ground and lay the cannas over your newly planted row. The scale develop its root systems in the fall, just like planting any other allium bulb. That's the process of getting them down in the ground in the fall. And don't wait till November, as soon as the bulbs come in, and your soil is cool, you know, down to um, you've had a few days at least, um, or maybe a week or two of 40 degree um, night temperatures, then this should be fine. This is a one season crop. When garlic comes up, it's up very early in the spring. So you have to be there to pull the mulch back as soon as the snow melts, they're coming out of the ground. And then about mid June, you'll see on the upper right hand corner, these scapes develop. These are the flowering stems of the garlic. And you don't want to let them go into flower because they will use up energy and your bulb will not be very big. So once the scape has done a, a single curly cue and before the flower bud opens that you see there, you need to go down to where that scape is coming out of the main stem of the garlic cut it off, bag them, put them in your refrigerator, share them with friends. They generally sell for close to $20 a pound. If you forget to cut your scapes off, I did purposely this year for one. And so on the left, you'll see the garlic bloom, which is, is not a big dramatic bloom like you'd see on other alliums, but you're seeing those longer elongated um, flowers coming out of the center there. So when do you harvest garlic? Usually around mid-July. Once you see the lower leaves starting to yellow, you get a, a spading fork out and carefully lift them up at that point. And then you need to dry them for a couple weeks, brush off the bulbs, cut off the roots. Finally brush your, uh, your uh, alliums with uh, like a potato scrubber um, and get all the dirt off and then go at it and start using them. I wanted to mention another garlic since we're talking about garlic and you'll see this out in the trade. It is strictly an annual here and it's not related to garlic at all, but it's called society garlic. It comes from South Africa and it has these beautiful um, striped, green and white striped leaves and then the um, violet to lavender colored flowers. That you can overwinter these plants. You can dig the bulbs up and replant in pots, or simply if you're growing this in a pot on your deck, you can bring the whole pot in and put it in a sunny window for the winter months, and then send it out, set it out again towards late May, early June after, well, generally after May 24th, which is our last date of frost here down in the Twin Cities. So Chinese chives, a lot of us grow them. They're very colorful uh, to give us bloom early in the spring and to attract the bumblebees, um, little flies and smaller bees also. Um, harvest the stems frequently. As soon as they finish blooming, you can shear the plant back, um, save, save the chive foliage stems, throw out the, uh, or compost the blooming stems that are done. Um, and if you just continue shearing, periodically throughout the season, you'll get more and more chives coming. Mary, we have a question. Yep. Um, Nancy is asking something that a lot of us have had an issue with is which of the alliums will not self seed because I've had problems with that. And speaking as somebody who um, encouraged her chives a little too much, um, but I have not had the problem with the other alliums, but apparently she has. Do any of them not self-seed? 
Well, the only ones I've ever noticed in my years of gardening are the Chinese chives and the garlic chives, which are notorious, you know, for seeding about. I have on occasion seen a few of the taller bulbous alliums, you know, drop, drop seeds and you'll have a few more plants coming, but I really haven't worried about that because it's nice to have more of them. But the other thing to keep in mind is after your alliums bloom, you have two choices. You can deadhead them, and then you don't have any worry about them seeding about. Or you can leave them up for a while because as they produce their um, fruits with the seeds inside, those green bumps, the best way to describe them, are really quite attractive. But then get in there, you know, before those bumps open up and start dropping seed. So in general, I I haven't had a big problem with any of the um, bulbous, I, b bulbous alliums, um, with the exception of a couple of the taller ones. But, you know, I've had an occasional plant show up and not many. So Allium schubertii is one everybody, when they see it, says, I've got to have this plant called the tumbleweed onion from the late 1800s. Um, this plant was not damaged by, by herbicide spray from a lawn. This is how the leaves normally grow. They recurve down just like you have in the Caratibians and some of the other shorter alliums. What makes this very distinctive is the uh, fireworks display of the bloom. So you have, as we're seeing in some of the newest breeding, you have many flowers clustered right at the stem and then you have additional flowers on elongated um, stems coming out from the bloom. And again, this is one that blooms in late May into June. Um, you'll see it used a lot in rock gardens. Now, here we're getting into some of the fibrous um, rooted alliums. These are the ones that you can divide in the spring or you can divide in the fall. If you're dividing them in the spring, it needs to be very early spring. Um, and when you dig them up, they'll be clustered and they may be swollen almost like bulbs at the base, but you'll notice the very strong fibrous root system. Um, this particular one has been out a few years. Um, it's great for rock gardens, it's great for borders. This is one that has, um, there's regular allium senescence and then there's blue eddy. Um, it has the recurved foliage. So this bluish green recurved foliage. Um, that people are always interested in. I used it to plant right al alongside, in a rocker and right alongside a curb because it was on a slope and I didn't want to have soil eroding from that slope. So once you get these in, they're a very, very good um, ground cover to prevent erosion. This is one I've grown for a number of years, even though it says zone six. I think I've grown it for about 20 years now. Um, it's called the Sicilian honey lily. Um, gorgeous blooms, but the problem is the blooms all hang down. So the only way to see the bloom is to go right up to it, lift up one of those stems, and you can see the flower. Um, this You'll see in the upper right-hand corner what the buds look like before they open, and people will say, what is this thing? It doesn't look like a typical, you know, rounded allium bulb, and that's because these will reflex. I'll show you another one of these a little bit later that they've developed um, that has um, flowers that stand upright and outright. Um, drumstick allium, we saw at the very beginning with the, uh, the yarrow blooms. Um, this goes back to the 16th century. These should be planted again in clusters for, for mass effect, but think about putting those clusters in around your perennials and annuals. Um, your annuals, of course, will get planted in the spring, so you have to be a little bit careful to know where they are, but most of your allium foliage is coming up very early in the spring before you'd be going out um, to plant annuals or perennials. This one gets up about two feet in height. Then we have stipitatum. Um, this is a, a recent award winner from the Royal Hort Society. 
This gets to a height of three feet with fairly large blooms, white blooms, six inches in diameter. That's a pretty good size. Um, and you're seeing it here growing in a garden with some ornamental grasses in the background. And I think those are tulips um, to the left. So it gives you an idea of the timing of the bloom. Then there's also uh, a newer one called White Giant, uh, three to four feet in height. Um, and again, notice the bright um, green ovaries in the flower that really enhance those white blooms. And then the garlic chives, which is the most notorious for spreading itself about. Chinese chives blooms in the spring, early summer. This one blooms in later summer. Um, so as Deb said, she thought she had a reversion of some sort because she had both, um, or she had her regular Chinese chives and suddenly it, it started blooming later in the summer with some white flowers. Um, there's a distinct difference. Chinese chives have a tubular leaf stem and garlic chives, which are much spicier, used a lot in Asian uh, food preparation, um, they have flattened leaves. And when you dig them up, you notice the name Allium tuberosum. They actually have little tubers at the base. And so when you buy them at Asian food stores, you'll notice they don't cut them off. They dig the whole plant up with the tubers there because the tubers will also be used for cooking. In my defense, from 10 feet away, it's okay. kind of hard to tell the difference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, another one from the late 1800s, Allium unifolium. Something again for a rock garden or front of the border. Um, three inch diameter flowers, so smaller blooms. So cluster these plants together. Firmament, okay, um, two to three feet in height. One of the parents is Christophii that we saw earlier, and it has four to five inch diameter globes for you to enjoy, but it's almost a magenta maroon color, very distinct. Forelock, notice they refer to Tom Banks' buddy Wilson in the movie Castaway. Um, this one looks like it has hair coming out of it. This is some of the breeding where you have the smaller flowers at the base of the flower uh, cluster, and then the upper flowers are bred so that they elongate, kind of like what you saw on the garlic bloom that I showed you a little bit earlier. This can get two to three feet and sometimes even taller than that. It's very long lasting, um, strong stems. You can cluster them, but you could also space them probably, you know, four to five inches apart um, to get them established. Then there are the larger ones, the three to four foot tall Allium gladiator that's been around for about 40 years, um, has rose purple uh, globes when they open and changing more to a darker purple. Um, zone five to eight, I have grown this without any problem. Globe Master has been out a long time again. These are some of the plants where you see the children standing around the stems, admiring them. We'll see one of those coming up yet. Eight to 10 inch diameter flowers. Um, Christophii is one of its parents. It blooms in late spring. And so these are the ones, these really tall ones that come up early, put their foliage out, um, and I think are more prone to foliage damage um, because of our late spring frost. So I mentioned earlier, you know, how to protect them. Now, this is something you put in a kid's garden to, for them to watch, but there are many um, specialty cut flower growers here in, in Minnesota that are growing this to sell at farmer's markets and to, you know, independent florists. Um, it's just outstanding in its appearance. It's so bizarre. Um, lots of people will plant it in a couple clusters in rock gardens to give you a little more height, um, but it's, it's a knockout and it's a bulbous one. So this is one that you do need to plant in the fall. Now, um, here's another one of the fibrous rooted ones. You don't buy bulbs of this in the fall to plant. 
uh, you buy the plants at the garden center. So lavender pop, um, bubbles um, blooms a little bit later than millennium and is also a darker uh, purple shade. It's um, very easy to grow. You'll see how it will cluster in a few years. You'll get big clumps. You can dig them up either in the spring, uh, very early spring that is, or late fall. Um, and if you're transplanting and dividing in late fall, it needs to be done um, by the end of September so they get well rooted to come back for you the following spring. Medusa um, is, an, is a, um, a bulbous one, um, also has twisted leaves to it, which gives people more interest in them. So hence the name Medusa. Um, it's similar in color and flower foliage to Blue Eddy, but in a much um, larger size and mass. Then we have Millennium. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, we have a, a bit of a warning from Nancy who says that hair is the one that has seeded itself a lot in my garden. Oh, okay. So, well, uh, Anyone Some else might want that to happen? It, just so you know, okay. <laughs> hair seeds about okay. Hair is a, a prolific propagator, then okay. So, millennium, um, you know, was first pretty much introduced into the market by um, Pete Odoff, um, and and focused a lot on the millennium gardens at Chicago when he put in a large garden there. Um, it's late July and August when it comes into bloom. Um, it's pretty much faded already because Laura was trying to get me a picture of a mass planting in South Minneapolis, but I think she didn't have time to get there um, when it was in bloom. And so now it's already just browning and going to seed. Uh, large two inch diameter blooms. This is fibrous rooted again. So lots of basal foliage, um, but you know, here it says zone five to eight. You know, this is this is fully hardy here in the Twin Cities and maybe even further north. Pinball Wizard, um, lovely color. Again, a shorter one that has very strong stems. When you look at the stems, you think, oh, this must be one of the giganteums because of the diameter of the stem, but it's not. It's only going to be about two feet tall. Um, it's a it's a cross between McLennii and Christophii, and we haven't even seen images of McLennii. There's so much breeding going on in the Netherlands with with these alliums. You'll be seeing a lot more coming out in future years. Allium pink pepper. Um, here they're showing it in a container. Um, again, a dwarf allium with fibrous roots. So that means you can buy it at a garden center in the spring, put it in a container. Here, I like the idea of it's in an individual container um, and you know, very well balanced with the foliage. Very late to bloom, late summer, um, early fall, but again, very short. So again, something to consider planting in the rock garden. Oops, I went the wrong way. God, I wonder who this was named for. Um, Purple Rain um, is a, a relatively newer selection, flowers in June, um, and it's three, um, the three and a half feet in height. Huge, again, purple shaped blooms. This is it again in June or in July at the Tatton Park Flower Show. It normally has some large strapping foliage to it which again was removed for this display. Zone three, so take it up into um, semi-northern Minnesota. Purple sensation. Now look at the shape of the blooms here. I mentioned that most alliums are gonna be globe shaped, but notice how this has a flattened bottom to it. Here they have it at the uh, White Flower Farm site. They're showing it interplanted with hostas. Um, and how the foliage of the hostas will then kind of hide the aging foliage of the alliums um, as that 
as that changes. It's said it's great to plant with silver foliage plants, um, bearded iris, or ladies mantle, um, alcamilla, but I can think of a lot of other combinations. You're seeing it here with tulips and uh, you know, just think of some of those early um, spring wildflowers that we have. What if you interplanted this with some some wild geranium or corydalus? Um, would be a very nice contrast. Okay, here's the traditional kid photo showing you the large diameter alliums and the kids that can't keep their hands off of them. These, this is one um, from Dutch bulbs getting three feet in height. There's a lot of different um, cultivars out there. Serendipity, um, this is another sport of millennium um, that is um, a lighter pinkish, um, rosy pink color, um, 10 to 15 inches in height. These make great, great border plants. Um, the photo that Laura had sent me was showing a staircase going up to a house in South Minneapolis uh, where they planted along the entire edge of the staircase to help stabilize the soil and yet provide a great bloom spot right there, uh, right underneath their iron railing. Um, notice 10 to 15 inches in height. Um, this again is coming into bloom in mid to late summer. Then we have sugar melt, um, another shorter one, often used in rock gardens, 12 to 16 inches tall or front of the border. Um, the leaves alone will get up to six inches tall and then these pale pink flowers will come up above it. So songsparrow.com, if you're not familiar with that nursery, um, is a great, that's a great spot to also find peonies if you're such a fan. Um, then we have summer beauty and the lower left photo is showing my former garden. And in the center of the photo, you're seeing summer beauty just budding. So it's, it's a very interesting plant to enjoy before it blooms, when it's in bloom and after it blooms. This is a, again, a fibrous rooted one with clump foliage. It can develop easily in a few years out to a mass size of probably 12 to 18 inches in diameter. Here's the one you like, you guys. It has sterile flowers, so no seed production. Summer drummer. Okay, look at this one. Um, it's a real new one, and it's four to five feet in height. And notice the thickness of the stems there. This is one I would space probably nine to 12 inches apart. But for this, again, flower show display, they mass clump them um, and they removed all the lower foliage so that you can, can see these. Um, now they mentioned the dried seed pod orbs stand garden sentry in a hauntingly beautiful way. And I really, even though you might get a bit of seeding, I really like to leave my alliums up um, as long as possible. When the stems start turning yellow and, and the stems start getting weak, then I will go in and, and deadhead them. Here's the one I mentioned. Um, we saw earlier the, the uh, Sicilian honeybell um, from the Mediterranean, and that one, all the flowers droop down. This is one that's a cross, um, or excuse me, it's it's a selection off of the first one, Allium siculum, and this one, the flowers stand upright and outwards. Um, they still have that interesting papery flower bud that's elongated that you see in the lower right photo. This says zones five to 10. The earlier one said zone six to 10. The six to 10 one, I've been, um, the Siculum vulcaricum, I've been growing for more than 15 years. Um, so I would really recommend you try it. Windy City for Chicago. Um, this is a dwarf one that also has fibrous roots, so you don't plant it as a bulb. Um, violet purple flowers, 15 to 18 inches in height. 
So this would be a great accent plant um, for the front of a sunny garden. And that is it. This is, this is the full allium display that they had from this one nursery who's unfortunately I lost the card I don't remember the name and you see they have some air muris in the background but they were featuring all of their specialty alliums um, and I think we've got an agapanthus in there too but it was quite an amazing display to see so now we're going to have questions yep um Honestly, you've answered all of them, except Anne wants you to go over again which ones you plant in the fall for next season. Okay, so the one, pretty much all of them, except the ones that I said that were fibrous rooted. So the Millennium, the Blue Eddy. Um, boy, let me just go back here. Let's talk about the ones that you don't have to plant in the fall because they're fewer. So these are the fibrous rooted ones, the Windy City, um, the Summer Beauty, uh, the Sugar Melt, the Serendipity, the Pink Pepper, Millennium, uh, Medusa, Lavender Bubbles, and I think that may be it. Wait a minute. The senescence is another one that you is not a bulb, so that you can plant from spring to fall, depending on when you get it. And of course, the chives and the garlic chives. And I think that's it. Most of them are most of them are bulbous here. Okay. Okay. Oh, hey. And now all of a sudden we have a lot more questions. Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, and, I, and I'm glad you're going to be getting these as a uh, something that you can review because then you'll see them all on there. Yeah. Um, Kathy wants to know, are allium resistant to road salt? Oh, boy. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think that's something you experiment with. Um, I think um just thinking about road salt and the fact that you're close to um a hard surface area that's a heat sink i would not plant your bulbous alliums there um because they generally prefer a moist rich soil with good uh with cooler temperatures and you won't get that if you're near a road or a driveway um the um staircase photo that Laura had sent me would oh yeah you know the fibrous ones the fibrous ones that I had planted around a curve uh, or a curb at a rock garden um, they're getting salted in fact the uh, snow blade jumped the curb and and scooped some of them out but I got them back in um, in the early spring so I think you'd have a better chance with the fibrous rooted ones because you have a larger root system to spread out and they tend to grow in drier um, soil sites. So I would not try the bulbous ones when you're anywhere near road salt. Okay, um, Doris wants to know, now I know there were more, there was more than one, but which were the ones that had the leaves curling down? Oh, so you had Carativiens, um, K-A-R. Well, we'll just zip through these real quick. Carativiens, zoom. let's zoom, we'll get up there. Zoom. Um, with the, um, come on. There was a lot of images here to dig out. Um, <laughs> come on. We'll get there. Well, wait a minute. What happened to them? I Maybe I didn't go far enough. Let's go back up. Maybe I went too fast. Uh-oh, what happened uh -oh. here? Uh-oh. Hey, um, just a second. Let me reopen Keynote. And file. Open recent. Alliums. Come on. Come on, Alliums. Okay, now I just have to hit play. I don't know sometimes what I do with this stuff. 
It happens to everyone. Hey, yeah. you're not the one who accidentally <laughs> turned their camera on last week. So, you know, I mean, that was camera. Me. On. I accidentally Good. turned my camera on. Here we go. Shibertii um, is one with the real curly foliage. Um, as far as the bulbous ones, um, let's go back. Carativiens. Here we go. Carativiens. Um, I know there's one more than that, so I must have missed it. It went too fast. Okay. Well, there's. Whoop. Oh, wait. Here we go. Nefskinum um, is another one with this giant, uh, the fairly giant leaves that are then curled under. Okay. All right. Excuse me. I'm sort of losing my voice here. I'm, I'm having water. Oh, we work you too hard. Hmm. All right, Michelle would like to know, uh, for all of them, does the foliage stay green until frost or are they sort of ephemeral? You know, the the large um, gigant with, with the large gigantic blooms, I usually see that foliage starting to yellow around midsummer. Um, you're not gonna have any problems with the fibrous rooted ones because their foliage is gonna stay green all season. But all of the alliums do tend to um, start fading out as far as their foliage color about a month after they have finished producing their fruits or seeds. Okay. Uh, Curtis has sent a, a lovely sweet message. Just says, hi, love this webinar. Thank you. Um, oh, but also wonderful. asks, do alliums have allopathic effects that inhibit the growth of nearby plants? Um, I do not have any knowledge that alliums are have um, a, cause an allelopathic reaction. Um, allelopathic, sorry, my bad. Yes, uh, you know, if if there was going to be one, I would tend to think it might be chives, just because of of their abundance and their heaviness. But I have never seen anything in the literature that talks um, about them producing an allelopathic effect. I mean, you see that in, in invasive plants like buckthorn will do that. Black walnuts ooze uh, something out of their roots that does that. Um, but I've never heard of Allium doing that. Hey, Terry would like to know how they do in clay soil. Ew. I don't think so. Um, I think, you know, what you might want to do is experiment and try. I would not try the bulbous ones at all. They don't have a chance um, in, a, in a heavy clay soil because there'll be too much moisture around the bulb and it will rot. But I would suggest trying uh, some of the fibrous ones, uh, fibrous rooted ones, you know, such as millennium and lavender bubble, bubbles and blue eddy. Um, you know, buy one plant and try it. You know, that doesn't mean you can plant into pure clay. You still need to work organic matter into that soil. Um, but if you're trying to look at things to plant into clay, um, you need clay buster plants. And so what is it? Prairie, Prairie Nursery out in, I think in Wisconsin, uh, which features native plants. They have a whole list of plants that they call clay busters that they know that the root systems can penetrate and get down through that. So for example, a lot of the cone flowers will do that. Um, Baptisia will probably do that. Anything that is extremely deep rooted and of course your native grasses will do that also. It just depends on how bad the clay is. I mean, if you can dig this out and you have a blue gray clay, I wouldn't try, try growing anything in that. Um, that's why we have um, blue, no, what is the county here in Minnesota? That's blue, blue something county because blue Earth, blue Earth blue County, Earth. because their soil is such heavy clay, it's very hard, you know, for anything to grow into that. And when you take that clay out of the hand, you can mold it in your hands. You could maybe make a croquet ball that you could then fire in a, you know, in a kiln, but um, 
clays are issues and and you're always in frank in most cases you're going to find clay around the exterior of homes because what contractors did and this isn't just recent this is in a hundred years ago they would do this because i had it around my house is they dig out all the soil to make the foundation and they take the top soil, which is really good and they go and sell it off and then after they got the foundation in, then they would pile all that was left, the subsoil, which is generally clay, right around the foundation. So often, you know, at least a foot or two out from a, a house foundation, you may find the most crappy soil <laughs> you've ever had to try to deal with. Diana has just sent in a message that says, the millennium does well in my clay soil. I've only Good. done slight amendments. Okay. Good. So thank you, Diana, for the update. That's that's good to know. See, sometimes we just need to have everybody answer the question. Absolutely. Um, Becky would like to know, why do the tips of the foliage on my purple sensation allium turn brown right after it comes up? Usually that's frost related, um, is what I always saw in my yard. You know, if we're gonna have, because when new foliage comes up, it's very, it's it's very cold hardy it's you know it's adapted to the colder weathers but as the temperature gets warmer in spring plants then lose their cold hardiness so then when a cold snap comes in it always seems to go to the very tips of the plant because that's the last part of the leaf that's going to get moisture from the roots and if your plants are dry this is another trick is if you're going into a frost the most important thing is to make sure your plants are well hydrated because they're better able to 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 deal with the frost without damage. Um, and and you know, for most people, they think, God, that sounds really stupid that you're putting all this water down around these plants when it's going to freeze. Um, but believe me, you've got to have your plants well hydrated, and they can often come through better. But again, a lot of this is the later spring frost um, where I just would keep a supply of these three to five gallon nursery pots around, turn them upside down, put a piece of fat over so no air could get in the holes and hold it down with a rock um, for when those night temperatures went like that. Okay, uh, Marion has two questions well a question and a comment first she says your series has been wonderful i've enjoyed them all and i wish you the best and will miss your sharing of your knowledge and i i have to agree with that mary because it is a pleasure working with you so well we're gonna we're gonna try to continue we're... these after yes. i get established in my new country where i'm going I was um, gonna... but we'll probably have to do them more like around noon time because I'm going to be eight hour, eight hours time zone different from here. So we are working on it, folks, we promise. Um, Marion would like to know, do alliums prevent Japanese beetles in your garden? And I said, I wish. And then I realized that, wait, maybe they're helping. I don't know anything to that effect. Um, okay. They obviously <laughs> don't go after, you know, Japanese beetles like to go to very thick, juicy leaves. So, you know, they like Virginia creeper, they love rhubarb. hollyhocks, rhubarb, they'll go after birch, you know, the roses. Um, and yet mm. these, I think maybe it's the um, flavoring in the, in the plant that may repel them, but I've never seen an actual Japanese beetle go on an allium plant. Okay. Yeah, I've got to say they're in the same bed as my rhubarb, and um, I don't really have rhubarb left anymore. I, I had no. it in the spring, and it it is kaput because it got eaten by the Japanese beetles. Um, yeah. Nance asks, can we take the dried seeds from alliums and throw them in our prairie garden to reseed? Well, if it's your own prairie garden, I don't see why not. Um, I just don't know how quickly they will. Once you have an established prairie garden, you know, you don't have a whole lot of sunlight reaching 
the ground, um, especially if you have grasses in there like a true prairie, um, you may want to just try taking those seeds, um, overwintering them in your refrigerator. Um, and by that, I mean, you take, you make sure they're completely dry, put them in a glass bottle jar, um, take a couple tablespoons of, if it's, do they still have it out there, powdered milk? Um, it does and wrap, exist. It does, okay. <laughs> it does. And wrap it in a, uh, in a Kleenex, you know, make a sachet out of it and set that into the jar. Um, you don't have to put it in the refrigerator. If you've got some area, if you have a true basement yet and not a recreation room where you've got a cold wall in the basement where it maybe goes down around 50 degrees, you know, set them there. But the trick is, is the powdered milk will absorb any extra moisture in the container. Um, and then in the spring, you could um, then either direct seed them outdoors or put them in the refrigerator for a couple of weeks to give them a cold treatment and then seed them in pots, you know, start them in packs and such. Um, and you could go and plant them out. Um, whether they get established really well in a prairie garden, you know, is a, is a good question. Um, because most of them like a more moist soil and you've got all these grasses and other wildflowers that are already got the root systems established, but why not give it a try? Okay, and unless anyone has any other questions, send them in now, because we're on our last one. Um, Bonnie would like to know, will any of them grow well in shade? Um, Ask Bonnie what kind of shade she has. Does she have morning shade, afternoon shade, uh -huh. all day shade? Okay, Bonnie, send it in. Let us know. <laughs> morning shade. So she has morning shade. So she she's getting sun shade. in the afternoon. So she's getting sun from like noon on. Um, yeah, I would I would try um, some of the bulbous. Um, iris or bulbous iris, bulbous alliums, <laughs> um, because I've had some, you know, seed into into more shady areas in my garden. So I think they can get get away with half a day of sun, and afternoon sun is always much more intense. Okay. Now is, is Laura going to talk about bulbs? Uh, sure. I hope so. In here. Excellent. Hey. Yep. Because hey, I don't everybody. know the details. <laughs> Uh, this is Lara with um, the Hort Society. I'm the Community Outreach Director. And yeah, thanks, Mary. This um, webinar was fantastic. I love alliums. Um, and we have a bulb sale going on. So as you all know, we are at the Minnesota State Fair every year. And it is a great place for us to connect with our members and to recruit new members. But we also generate a lot of revenue there. So in lieu of the State Fair, we've come up with a couple of fundraisers and one of, of them is this fall bulb sale. Um, we've partnered with a vendor named Brent and Becky's Bulbs and they have a fantastic program where they will donate 25% of sales back to us. So, um, and they have a lot of the alliums, the varieties that Mary went through tonight. So. It's pretty cool. Um, so how you can um, find out more information about the bulb sale is you can go to our website at northerngardener.org. On the home page, you can scroll down and you'll find the tile that says fall bulb sale. Click on that and it will give you step, step by step um, instructions on how to buy your bulbs. And they're all fall planted bulbs. So great. You Thank go. you, Laura. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank and you, Mary. Thank you, You're Mary. Welcome. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. After the webinar, you will receive a survey. We would really appreciate it if you would complete it and provide us with your feedback. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. And you're welcome, Nance. <laughs> Just sent in a thank you. Um, Oh my goodness, more thank yous.
Okay. Everyone loves you, Mary. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You too, Deborah. So, aw, thanks. Yeah. So, on behalf of the Minnesota State Horticultural Society and Laura and Mary and myself, thank you for joining us today and stay safe. <laughs>